Yeah, good morning. Wonderful sights here. Thanks for getting me here. Um, and, and thanks for the brilliant inter introduction, which really makes things a bit easier for me. Um, first of all, I should mention I did not make the semantic distinction between replicability, reproducibility, and the third one I forgot already. <laughs> Repeatability. Repeatability and, and all that. I think to make already a, a wrap up <coughs> now, none of them we have. So, we'll, um, so whatever I've been talking about fits perfectly to, to all three of them. Um, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to take part in the previous discussion, so maybe I blurb something which already is, has been discussed. Please give me some feedback, let me know, stop me from saying too many redundant things. Um, I also should point out um, your enemy protein I did not simulate yet, so <laughs> too complicated. Um, okay, so just a few scattered thoughts to, to spur the discussion. Actually. Um, I went into that kind of discussion many years ago with a mathematician. Um, they tried to help us with our <laughs> simulations. I encountered that several times. Um, you, as soon as you give them a real problem, they don't come back. Um, but this mathematician, uh, quite clever guy, uh, Peter Teufelhardt in Berlin, uh, he pointed out that we cannot do the simulations in the first place at all, it doesn't make sense at all. And, and the reason is of course the chaoticity of the system, I don't know if this is the right word, chaoticity, yeah, I think so. Um, which all of you know, you also alluded to that already in your introduction, so if you start any reasonable molecular dynamic si system with more than two atoms, um, there's a really small difference in, in the last digit, even double precision, and you just let them run, uh, you will find out they will diverge in phase space after a few picoseconds, quite quite quickly. I'm not saying they are fully <coughs> decorrelated, but they are quite distant in, in terms of RMSD or so in phase space. That happens more or less immediately. And so this mathematician argued, well, an American mathematician, uh, by the way, that um, whatever you do, you can never be accurate enough um, to, to really calculate the true real trajectory. And that was kind of a surprise to me because I never have thought about that this way. The um, reason was that I kind of implicitly knew, and that's what I also told him, of course, uh, that also nature doesn't do that as accurately. So if nature doesn't do it, I don't have to do it either in my simulation. And, and that was my main argument. This argument, that is, was a strange experience, I never got across to this mathematician. So he always insisted I will make errors, and that will destroy my trajectory after a few picoseconds. It doesn't make sense at all uh, to talk about any trajectory. Don't do it. Yeah, that was send a probe to Mars. That is a not chaotic system, but don't do the simulations. Um, he doesn't now still, but uh, okay. So that that was my kind of. Can I, can I yes, please. Does statistics help in his view, or is it, uh, what's the problem exactly? I'll get to that. Um, I, in my view, statistics is the key to everything right. here, of course. Um, but that is also something I didn't get across. Okay. But I'll get back to that exactly. So essentially that, that brought me to think a bit, a little bit more about um, what do we, yeah, we had the same question before, what do we mean by reproducibility? Certainly we don't mean to reproduce, I think, the same identical <coughs> project. Uh, you all know we can do that, of course, but we need the same seed for the same random number generator. We need the same CPU. We must not do it on a parallel computer because otherwise we don't reproduce. So all these things uh, make it simply impractical to, to reproduce a simulation. So what do we want to reproduce? And what I learned from the mathematician, if you can't really get forward, just define it. And so the definition I came up with at that time was simply, I called it at that time relevant observables, you may also call it essential or stable observables. Um, all those which despite the fact that the individual trajectory may differ, turn out within a certain error range to be the same, only those can be interesting in a certain sense observables. And typically that would be averages like uh, RMSFs, uh, average distances, average structure, um, some spectra, transition rates, average transition rates um, or mean first passage times. 
of course, free energy is hopefully um, an experimental observer, but anything which you calculate and can be measured, reliable, obviously also should be reproducible. So any variable which does not show this chaotic behavior because it's averaged out, I guess those are the observables which we should strive for. And that is where exactly what you mentioned, statistics <coughs> comes into place. But of course, in a weird way, because we all know that estimating errors uh, can be very, very hard in the simulations. I, by the way, I kindly disagree with uh, you should not spend too much time to learn how to calculate errors because there's a black box which does it for you. No, I, I, I strongly in fact disagree. As soon as you rely to black boxes on black boxes, your errors may be too small. And there is nothing worse than errors estimated too small. We know it from the free energy business. All the errors we calculate are typically too small. Uh, because we rely on black boxes uh, which have to uh, some, rely on some mathematical theorem, but forget the assumptions underlying that. Okay, at the very end of the day, of course, we want to get to the functional mechanism, and also those um, should be, uh, of course, reproducible and, and, and stable in the sense which I mentioned. One example, what I'd like to show is simply a particular case of an observable which we calculated a long time ago, and that's the the rupture force which you need to rupture a non-covalent bond of ligand and a receptor, which can be done by experiment, IFM experiments. And uh, what, what I would like to share you here would be what I think we should really, when it comes to quality, we should really aim at. We should aim at can we predict something which can be measured, ideally before uh, it is measured and ideally by another group. So it can be predicted within a certain error margin and within our errors, which we give in within the experimental error. I guess that is the gold standard, uh, what we all should, should aim for. That's an example here. So uh, this is how fast you pull uh, the ligand and the receptor apart, and that is the force which you need for that. And the blue is experimental data by Simon Scheuring and, and co-workers. And the green here, that is simulation data. And obviously, we're still limited to short time scale. That's why we have to pull fast. But you can see that now we start to overlap here and uh, within the error bars, which just come from 20 repetitions of each uh, reproduction scale of each uh, loading rate here, um, we can get quite nice agreement. I guess that's really the ultimate test. And also, ideally, um, it should be against an observable like force here, which has never been used by anybody to calibrate the force field which we are using here, right? So that means that in general is our approach. And if we do that, I guess then we can start to, to put some trust in, into the simulations. That may still many things go wrong, but that is what we should aim for, I think. So I, I mentioned already, is nature uh, reproducible anyway? No, it's not. And uh, there are several reasons, in fact. Uh, one is, of course, statistical mechanics. Um, proteins are not in vacuum, but they are in an environment. Other proteins are around, water is around, molecules bumping on the surface of the protein, solid molecules, etc. So already in a classical world, which our simulations are in, at least as the nucleic motion is concerned, um, already there, uh, nature is by no means reproducible, so why should beauty in, in a strong sense? And, and the second is, of course, quantum, on top of that is quantum mechanics, which even if the protein were in vacuum and everything, still it would not always follow the same trajectory because the trajectory is not even defined in quantum mechanics. So um, from that also follows, from an evolutionary perspective, if I want to achieve a certain function as a protein, um, I better be robust against these perturbations. If I'm not, uh, then probably that's not a reliable function uh, in, a, in a protein. And that makes our life a little easier. Um, we just have to be uh, as <coughs> inaccurate as, as nature is. Yeah, we can afford a certain level of inaccuracy, and actually that is where we all rely on. Okay, so much for, for that. Another piece of thought I'd like to just bring up is then what you might call <coughs> reproducibility. And that, of course, uh, links to what I've said. Use of random numbers. If you don't start with the same random number for your heat bar, uh, then you don't get the same trajectory. It depends on what precision uh, you're using. 
uh, it depends on the sequence of the operations. If you add a large number to a small number, and then you add another small number that gives a different result, typically than if you add the first the two small numbers in the first place, and only then to the large number. So these things can kill you, and partly do, and you have to take care of those. And that specifically means that as soon as you go to a parallel machine where the sequences of operation are not always determined uniquely, then already from that fact you get different results which are then not reproducible. And of course, if you go to a different GPU, they, of course there's an IEEE standard on floating points, but it leaves a few options open when it comes to, to rounding up or down. And so that means if you go to a different CPU or even a GPU, you may get different results. Uh, there may be even bugs in the GPU as we have seen in Intel GPUs, uh, in CPUs. On top of that, come, and, and we discussed that this, this breakfast, breakfast um, approximations we're using. And I think that is probably where we might want to spend most of our thoughts uh, when it comes to, yeah, like, transferring the simulation package and then give as a complete uh, box if, if you want. Um, because we all use a number of approximations and that is a bit <coughs> different from, from maybe quantum chemistry where things are a little more easy. I'm not saying they are really easy, but I think they are easier uh, compared to what we are doing here. Um, because the, the, the methods they are using are really very, very well defined. And that's not so much the case in our hands, I'm afraid. Um, for example, uh, electrostatics calculations. We all use uh, PME or something. Uh, other times we used cutoffs. Um, we may use uh, fast multiple methods. There are different approximation schemes. And they give different kinds of errors. But all may be accurate within, say, 10 to the minus 6 in, in the forces. But still, the errors are of different kind. And some errors may be malicious, others may be uh, benevolent and, and uh, even help us. Um, <coughs> it's not enough to just specify an accuracy, I, I'm afraid. For example, um, if you use a cutoff, you can have a pretty accurate force, but because it's systematically always wrong in the same direction, um, it can accumulate to, to large artifacts, whereas if in PLD, things tend to average out a little bit more beneficially, and so. Uh, even with the same accuracy, numerically, you get probably quite different accuracy in your relevant observables then at the end of the day. Uh, multi, multi time stepping is another approximation, besides we you name it. I think our field, because it's so computationally demanding and so dealing with so complex systems, also is methodologically really, really complex. Uh, and we have to get this under control. Um, yeah, I was mentioning quantum chemistry, and I think it does help to look at other fields which are, in that respect, in terms of standardization and reproducibility, more advanced than, than we are. And I think that's not our fault, it's just that our job is, is much harder. Um, I mentioned quantum chemistry, you may also have to look into solid state physics, for example, where also the standards for electronic uh, level calculations are pretty high. And, uh, well, <laughs> on the side, but also helps us go to an electron volt rather than kilojoule. The errors look much, much smaller if you go to So we, with our kilojoules, it's really, they, they come up and say, oh, point to uh, electron volt, we are super accurate, yeah. Um, I was surprised on that. Maybe their standards are not as high as ours. It's, it's really too, in our field, a fraction of a KT can make a big difference. Um, actually, that is what, what very often happens in proteins, yeah, if you do some uh, regulation, it can be a fraction of a KT. Uh, and antibiotics we have studied uh, binds in the tunnel of the ribosome of bacteria because there's just one H bond more than in our ribosome. So what the difference between life and death, both for bacteria and us, is just one H bond. A uh, few K kilojoule or something. That, that's, <coughs> that's really frightening. And, and that is for a system which has about two million atoms, which means for each atom, this accuracy has to be, has to be really tremendous. And, and that makes our life really, really hard. Um, and I think it's, it's really much harder than in quantum chemistry and then solid state physics and humanity. Okay, and finally, um, I, I just listed here what you may call practically reproducibility. We can never get to this R word here, reproducibility. 
if you run a simulation for a year or, or something uh, on a huge machine, you will just not get anybody to repeat your simulation. It's about a similar problem as we have in elementary particle physics, right? If you build a huge accelerator at this, <laughs> or at, at CERN, uh, nobody will build a second one just to, to represent <laughs> the experiment. That will not happen. And, and it's a bit like that also in, in our field here. Um, and we have just to be aware of it. I'm not saying there is something really fundamentally wrong with that. Uh, it's just a fact that we have to deal with that. Um, and I didn't list that here, but uh, because it was also mentioned, um, I think in our field what is really crucial and important is error calculations and how do we deal with bad statistics. Um, it, it was pointed out that it is really hard to, to come up with good statistics in our field. Uh, we are happy if we see a conformational transition which is functional maybe once or maybe twice. Uh, then we write a paper. And it's, by the way, not exceptional that it takes a year to get the paper actually written, even not, not talking about getting it published. Um, so, um, to deal with, with small number of events, I think in our field is very critical. So one additional term I would like to throw in there is, uh, is a very good uh, statistics or probability theory we, we need. And in my view, there's only one, this is base theory. And I think our field should really look more closely to Bayes because Bayes is the only correct way to calculate errors, I would claim. This is a bit controversial, um, but this is a discussion here. So um, there's only way to, one way to add up to numbers, three and four is always seven. And if you deal with probabilities, there's, in my view, only, way, only one way to do it right, and, and this is by Bayes. And therefore, I think our field should also learn to do small numbers and calculate errors and probability distribution just the correct way. Uh, and this I miss very much in our field still. So that just came to my mind when we were talking about error bars. And so no, I don't want uh, black boxes for error bars. Okay, uh, I guess that's about it. Uh, just one, one brief thought where all what I was talking about and what, what's discussed here also becomes, I think, very important. I think the field is kind of mature to, to one more step uh, from just looking at individual systems and, and finding out how these systems actually work. And so we're doing that all the time, and it's highly exciting. Uh, but I think we are, we are in a position where we can also look at many systems at once and, and, and try to conclude from, from a whole bunch of, of situations. Um, and we are, of course, not the first to do that. It has occurred whenever uh, a field was mature enough to collect a lot of data. For example, in uh, astrophysics, uh, people discovered, uh, I think it was Herzsprung and Russell, uh, that st certain stars have certain colors and that relates somehow to their brightness and uh, to their absolute brightness. <coughs> and only from that, serving a whole large number of stars, they were able to conclude how stars evolve. Um, that was a big achievement only possible by looking at a whole bunch of things rather than by, as was done before those guys, uh, at individual stars and try to make something up from, from them. And of course in sequence uh, alignment the same thing happens. So looking at many sequences taught us a lot of things. Looking at many structures, same thing again, taught us that, for example, structures evolve much more slowly than sequences underneath. Uh, which is a bit puzzling, but that's exactly what we learned from looking at many structures in the PDP as soon as a few thousand were available. And, and I think it, it's really time to do the same thing in molecular dynamics and, and try to see how this dynamic <coughs> space actually looks like and how proteins distribute in this dynamic <coughs> space. And also there, it's of course absolutely crucial to understand, uh, now if you do several simulations with several uh, force fields and, and other approximations, how do the protein in dynamic space, how do the dynamical fingerprint actually uh, depend on those approximations and what is real differences between certain proteins? Um, so I'm just saying we, would, we should fill the, the link in a more systematic way than just looking at individual proteins. And a brief preview is what we term the dinosome, so rather than just simulating one protein, as I said, we went to something like a few hundred. And try to answer the question, if we have now two proteins um, of different structure, is their dynamics different or not? And, and that seems to be 
may be a completely crazy question, because of course the dynamic is different. You can't even compare the dynamics if you have different structure, right? And, and I'm claiming yes, you can. Uh, you can just need just to come up with the right metrics to do that. Dynamics may be very similar, despite the fact that the underlying structure is very different. And um, if you exploit that, you can actually, in some abstract dynamic space, map out function. So what is shown here is, I'm not going into detail due to lack of time, but what's shown here is just uh, a kind of a graph theoretical connection of, of these 100 proteins. Each dot would be one protein. And they are just laid out here, uh, projected down to, to two dimensions uh, in this graph, according to their similarity. So if they are connected, their dynamics is very similar. And if they are far apart here, their dynamics is very dissimilar. And what we have done here, we have plotted on those proteins functional classes. So we've highlighted, for example, signaling proteins here, transcription proteins, proteinases, glycosidases. And as you could see, they are not uniformly distributed over the whole dinosaur space, as we call it. Um, but they cluster in, in certain regions of that space. And that makes it possible to predict function just from looking at the dynamics, not in, in that sense. So if you give me a new protein, I do a simulation, I try to place the new protein somewhere in this graph, and then I can tell what's in my environment. If it ends up here, I would predict it's a signaling protein. If it ends up here, I would probably predict it's a glycosidase and so on. And if you do that, I ah, don't have the slide, but if you do that, then you can ramp up the success rate for predictions from 30% to 50% or something. Structure-based predictions of function 30%, 50% if you include dynamics. So that actually helps. And, and that is something where we are now working really hard to, to see in, in such a graph how, how much will the protein move just due to numerical inaccuracies, just due to the choice of force, just by repeating the same simulation with a different seed. So what is the error range of this position uh, in, in that strange space? So that is also something which we uh, address. And I, I think it can only be done by repeating many simulations and, and see actually how, how much it scatters. I think my time is yeah, I think we are, over at least we are, far, several fold. We are running a little, we start a little And so I stop right here. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Sure. So your yeah. comments about LHC where they don't run it twice. The LHC experiment was actually designed with two completely separate teams. Yeah. Two yeah. Completely yeah. 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 And actually I think we should learn from that. Yeah. And to be honest, when we have we want to run a simulation to predict as observable, you should take two completely separate teams, two completely separate methods, on them separately. Yeah. And I think we shouldn't actually be refereeing applications and say, I want to run one zero simulation. We should say no, we don't do that. The one simulation is not useful. The URC will give out the prices as much money. <laughs> well, they did. And the visit community said that because they have the same people who produce quality prices as we did. I think we need to have that. So actually, there's no point spending six months running one simulation on the machine because it's a completely worthless thing that it's out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we can leave that for a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I also just want to make a point. I did not suggest black boxing error calculations. Okay, just great. a paper.